Well, good morning again. And as we come to the scripture this morning, I want to just start off by simply saying this. In fact, this is the title of the sermon today. There's hope and you do not have to be afraid. That's the good news this morning as we come to the scriptures. I don't know about you, but I am thankful for the Bible, for the word of God, that God reveals himself to us in the scripture, that he reveals his ways, he reveals his plan, he reveals his heart so that we can understand and know what God is doing. And in fact, I can tell you this morning that despite how things look, Despite how things feel, despite the panic, despite the empty shelves, despite the fact that you can't find toilet paper anywhere. Are you with me this morning? I mean, unbelievable. People are stocking up on everything. It's an amazing thing to me. People seem to be panicking and fearful. Despite all of how that looks, despite of the potential economic problems that you and I could in fact be facing, in spite of the fact that the entire world this morning is wrestling with this same issue. In spite of all of those realities, the fact of the matter is that you and I can have hope this morning and we can face the future with absolute confidence about what's going to happen. That's true because of four realities that are revealed to us in the Bible. God has spoken clearly. He has shared with us and told us what is going to happen and what we need to see. The four realities are simply who God is, what God has done, what God is currently doing, and what he's getting ready to do. I want to explore those with you quickly this morning. The first reason you and I have hope is because just of who God is. That's his nature, his character, the person that he is, and the fact that his person never changes. The Bible says in Psalm 146 and verse 5, in the New Living Translation, it reads like this, happy are those whose hope is in the Lord. We could say, hopeful are those whose hope is in the Lord, or peaceful are those whose hope is in the Lord. Listen, happy are those whose hope is in God. Why is that true? Well, it's kind of like saying, wet are those who jump in the ocean, or hot are those who get too close to the sun, or full are those who eat a big plate of spaghetti. Now, why are those things true? Well, because the ocean is wet, and if you jump in it, you get wet, and spaghetti is heavy, and it makes you full, and the sun is a big blazing ball of fire, and when we get close, we are going to get warm. Listen to it again. Happy are those whose hope is in the Lord. They've set their hope, their confidence in the future is in God, and that's why they're happy, because of his nature, because of who he is. The Bible gives us clear revelation about the person and the nature of God. He's not an angry God in heaven just waiting to crush us. The Bible says that God is love. He doesn't just love. He doesn't just express love. No, God is love in his very nature. Like the sun is a fireball, God is love. He loves consistently. He never runs out of love. It is never frustrated. His love is never changing. His actions and his behaviors always come out of that fact that he is love. God always loves. His love cannot fail because just like water is wet, God is love. The Bible says that God is also good. I love that, that God is just good. He is kind. There's no evil, no hurt, no maliciousness in the person of God. Everything that God thinks and plans, he thinks and plans with good intentions in mind. And the Bible says that he is just, he is merciful, and he is gracious. Those three things really go together. God is a just God. He always judges and acts fairly. He always does the right thing at the right time in every situation. He is never unjust or unfair. And God is merciful. What does that mean? It means that he does not give us what we deserve. Oh, God, because of his great mercy, doesn't treat us the way we deserve, but he is also gracious, the other side of that coin. That means he not only doesn't give us what we do deserve, but he does not give us what we, or he does give us things that we do not deserve. Let me illustrate it like this. If I left here today and I was pulled over by the local Dowland police force and uh, the officer walked up to the window and he says, sir, you were going 50 miles an hour over the speed limit. 
And I would say, oh, I'm so sorry about that, officer. I wasn't paying attention. And he says, well, I don't care that you weren't paying attention. You deserve a ticket today. But I tell you what, I'm going to be merciful to you, and I'm not going to give you this ticket. That's mercy. But then if he said, hey, you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to give you a $50 bill. Why don't you go and treat your wife to lunch? That would be grace. God is just. He always does the right thing. He is fair in his judgments because he understands all things. He is merciful. He doesn't give us what we deserve. And he is gracious. He gives us things that we do not deserve. And we'll explore why in just a minute. The Bible says he's long-suffering. That is, he puts up with us. He, he never gets impatient with us. He doesn't run out of patience and gets frustrated. He's holy. He's completely different. No evil of any kind in God. The Bible says he is all-knowing. He knows your past. He knows your present. And he knows your future. He knows your heart. God never forgets anything. God is not up in heaven wringing his hands trying to figure out what in the world to do. He already knew all things. He is all wise. He understands all that's going on. The Bible says he is all powerful. God has the ability and the power to do whatever he pleases in every situation. He is always present. I love that. The Bible says that no matter where we are, God is present with us. In fact, David said in the Psalms, there's no place I can go to get away from God whether in the darkest corners of the world, the highest heights or lowest places. God is always present. Now think about this one minute. God is fully and completely present with you right there where you are right now. All of God, all present right there. Not a part of him, not a piece of him, but all of God. All of his heart, all of his attention, all of his ability is right there with you right now. And he is right here right now. And he is in China right now. God is everywhere present, actively present, all of the time. The Bible says we live in him. We travel in him. We are always in the presence of God. I love that he is always present. That's why the psalm says he can be our refuge because he's an ever-present help. The Bible says he's sovereign. That means he has complete authority over all things. He is faithful. He always does what he says he will do. And he is unchanging. I never have to wonder how God will respond because he never, ever, God is never in a bad mood. Aren't you glad for that? God always is the same. He always is loving. He's always kind. He's always all powerful. He's always sovereign in every situation. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 8, that he is the same yesterday today and forever. You see, here's the point this morning. Despite the reality of the coronavirus virus and all that could potentially happen, in spite of the fact that all of those things are looming and potential realities, here's the truth. God in his character God in his nature, just who God is. He has the qualities, he has the ability, he has the motivation, he has the power, and thank God he's got the heart to work in your behalf to bring a better future into existence for you, regardless of what happens around us or to us in these next few days or weeks. We have hope today because of the nature and the heart and the character of God. Listen to it one more time. Happy are those whose hope is in the Lord their God, who put their confidence in God, not in the circumstance, not in what's going on around them, but they choose to look higher and recognize that God is who he says he is. I'm thankful for that this morning. But that's not the only reason we have hope today not just because of who God is. You know, oftentimes when tragedy happens or when there's suffering in the world, and there's always suffering in the world, isn't there? And oftentimes people look at the suffering, the heartache in the world, and they'll say, why doesn't God do something? If he's so loving and good, why doesn't he do something? I've heard that many times. And the, the truth of the scripture, what the Bible tells us is simply this. God has done something. God is doing something. And God's getting ready to do something. And that gives me hope today. God has already done something. 
The Bible tells us very clearly that God became a human in the person of Jesus Christ. God came into the world of our suffering to suffer with us and to suffer for us and to deliver us from suffering by giving us the gift of eternal life. He stood at the, at the tomb of his friend Lazarus and the Bible said, even though Jesus knew he was going to raise him from the dead, in just a few minutes, the Bible says, Jesus was deeply troubled. He was angry. He was indignant at what sin and heartache had brought. And Jesus wept because Jesus came into the world to suffer with us and for us. But thank God, he is also lifting us out of that suffering. You see, here's the reality. Sickness disease, the coronavirus, cancer, death, all of the evils, the abuse, all that goes on in the world that is evil and harmful today. All of it was not God's plan or intention for humanity. It was not his doing. The Bible teaches us very clearly that all of these things are a direct result of satanic deception and of the sinful rebellion of mankind. They are the consequences, the natural results of worshiping something other than God and ignoring God to do our own thing. But God loved us so much that in spite of our rebellion, he refused to leave us without hope. And God himself in the person of his son, Jesus, came into the world to rescue us from ourselves and from all of the evil that's in the world. Philippians chapter 2 puts it like this. It says in the New Living Translation that even though Jesus was God... He did not demand and cling to his rights as God. Now, just pause there for a minute. God could have stayed in heaven. He could have just looked down and said, too bad. You chose it. Just live in it now. You made your bed lie in it. But that's not what God did. No, God's heart loved us so much. He was so just and merciful and good that he became human himself in the person of Christ. He didn't demand and cling to his rights as God, but he made himself nothing, it says. He took the humble position of a slave and he came in human form. You see, when Jesus came into the world, he lived a perfect life. He never disobeyed God in one way or another, in his heart, his motives, his behavior, his speech. He sacrificed himself willingly at the cross. They didn't take Jesus' life. He offered it to them. He offered it for our sake. He died. He was buried. And he was raised back to life and appeared to many, many people over a period of 40 days that substantiated it. All of these things, and now he sits back in heaven at the right hand of God in absolute authority. God has already done something about the suffering in the world. All the sickness, the heartache, uh, the brokenness, the abuse, uh, the, the evil hearts of men. Jesus has done something. He has come to change our hearts and deliver and rescue us from all of the evil that's in the world. As we turn to Jesus Christ, there begins to be hope because when Jesus did that, he did two important things. When Jesus came and did all that he did, he made complete forgiveness possible and he bought for us entrance into the very presence of God. He brought relationship with God back into the focus, back into reality. So even though we were far from God, we could be close again and be in his presence. I love the book of Colossians in chapter 1, verse 19. Listen to these verses from the New Living Translation. For God, in all of his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. God reconciled us. We didn't take the first move. He did. God made peace through everything in heaven and earth. How? By the means of Christ's blood on the cross. Christ shed his blood for our reconciliation. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies separated from God by your evil thoughts and actions. And yet now God has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result... He has brought you into his own presence and you are holy, that is, set apart and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. 
For every person who chooses to trust in Christ, this is a true statement. I am holy before the Lord, blameless, even though I have sinned and blown it, even though I have messed up many, many times, yet because I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's given me his righteousness, I am holy in the sight of God as I come trusting in Christ. He sees his righteousness and not my brokenness. By his perfect obedience of the law, by his perfect life, his willingness to take the punishment for our sin at the cross, Jesus canceled all of the debt that we owed God. He took away all of the blame so that Satan cannot blame us. And if we confess our sins, God is faithful and he is just. He is faithful to his word, faithful to his covenant that if we believe Christ will forgive. And he is just. He poured out all of his justice on Jesus at the cross so that we could have mercy and find grace. That's what God has done for you and me today. And that's the basis of our hope. But you say, oh, pastor, come on. What does that have to do with the coronavirus? What does it have to do with my financial problem? What does it have to do with the fear that I'm feeling right now about what's coming on? Listen to me. Listen to me. It has everything to do with it. I'll tell you why. Because the ultimate reason for fear, the ultimate source of fear, the ultimate source of insecurity, the ultimate source of that, uh, that uh, panic that grips our hearts when things are falling apart around us, when we face the storms or issues of life. The ultimate source of that fear is a broken relationship with God. The Bible tells us that when Adam and Eve first disobeyed God, that they immediately, their eyes were opened and they realized their guilt before the Lord. And the Bible says that they heard God coming and the Bible says they hid themselves. And when God said, where are you, Adam? What's going on? Adam responded like this, I hid because I was naked and I was afraid. When he was talking about being naked, he wasn't just talking about physically. No, what Adam was saying is, I realize now I'm exposed, I'm vulnerable, I'm guilty. And people have still been hiding from God and ignoring God generation after generation after generation because we're exposed, we're guilty. We avoid God. We avoid him ever since, refusing to come into the light for fear that our real motives, the real intents of our heart and our selfish nature would be exposed. But guess what? God knows it all. He sees in the depth the resources of our hearts. And yet he loves us and he's given Christ for us. You see, God himself is the ultimate place of safety. He is the ultimate place of fearlessness. I mean, think about it. The entire world is in panic today. It could be chaos. We could have economic meltdown. And yet, The scripture says that ultimately all things will come to an end. All of us one day are going to die. Unless Jesus comes back first, we're all going to go the way of death. And Jesus told us to build our lives on him because at the end of the day, it is relationship with him that takes away all the fears. You see, here's the deal. Because God is the ultimate place of safety. When you and I are not in right relationship with God, no matter how hard we try, no matter how much money we make, no matter what possessions we have or what positions we hold, fear is the ultimate result of not being rightly related to God because somewhere down deep, we know that things are not right. But God's perfect love, the Bible says in 1 John 4, when we begin to understand the perfect love of God in Jesus Christ, That fear begins to be removed from us. His love drives out all fear because he removes the guilt and the condemnation of sin so that we can be at peace with God. And being at peace with him brings all of God's blessings to us. Romans says that being justified by trusting Christ means that we move into a different state. The Bible says that apart from Christ, we stand or we are in or we live in under condemnation. Not because God wants to condemn us, but just as a result of who we are. But it says once we trust in Christ, the Bible says that we move into and we stand in the realm of God's grace. That is his undeserved and unearned favor. A follower of Jesus Christ 
has undeserved blessing on their life. And the Bible says because of that, we sang it earlier today in one of our songs, I am the righteousness of God. Well, how am I the righteousness of God? Because I do everything right? Well, you can ask my wife, she'll tell you I don't do everything right. Well, why am I the righteousness of God? Because I have acknowledged that I am broken and I need Jesus. And I've trusted in Christ and he's given me his righteousness. And the Bible says that because of that, all of the promises of God. Listen, 2 Corinthians 1.20. No matter how many promises God has made, and he's made promise after promise after promise, the Bible says that all of them are available to me. They're all yes to me. As I trust in Christ because of his righteousness, I can claim all of God's promises in the Bible because God loves me even as he loves Jesus Christ. And so I can ask anything with confidence based on the teaching of the Bible and the righteousness of Christ, and I can have confidence that God will help me. Listen, we've got hope today. You've got hope. I know it looks bad. I know there's a lot going on. I know some of you are facing some financial issues because of shutdowns and all this. Listen, I know. But listen, there's hope because of who God is. There's hope because what he's done. And thank God there's hope because of what he is currently doing in the world. God is currently at work. He's not stopped. He's not given up. God is at work this morning. Jesus said in John 5, 17, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. And somebody out there saying, well, what in the world is he at work doing? I'm so glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. God is at work this morning. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.11 that we know exactly what he's doing. Here's what he's doing. God is working out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In other words, from the very beginning, God has had a plan, and God is currently working that plan using all of the events of history, all of the decisions of humanity to accomplish his ultimate plan for the world. History is moving forward exactly according to the plan of Almighty God. He is sovereign over all and uses all that goes on to accomplish his will. You know, for those of us who are trusting Christ, I got some really good news for you. I know exactly what God's doing in your life this morning. You ready? Here it is. Romans chapter 8, 28. He's working all things together for your good. Philippians 2, 13. He is working to teach you to be content in any and every circumstance because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Ephesians 3, 20. If you're a Christian this morning, he is working within you to do immeasurably more than you even ask or imagine him to do by the power of his spirit. Romans 8, 26. He's at work in you this morning to help you pray. And when you begin to pray, even use sounds and syllables you're not aware of. In the book of Acts in 1 Corinthians, God's at work today through his church to inspire supernatural gifts and miracle and faith. In 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, God's at work in your weakness for when we're weak, then he is strong. That's what God's doing today. And in your life, Philippians 4, 13, he's helping you be content. And John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, says Jesus. It's not like the peace the world gives. No, no, no. It's different than the world. The world's peace is contingent on what has happening. If there's food on the shelves, but in the realm of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural peace of God. For those who are followers of Christ, God is at work to do these things in your life today. But I'm glad today that God is at work in the world through people. He's delegated the earth to people, and God works through people. God's working today. He's working through the researchers. He's working through the doctors and nurses. Listen, God is the ultimate source of those gifts. We pray for those individuals. We believe God to quicken them and help us. He is at work through our governmental leaders, the Bible says, that we are to obey those in authority over us unless they're asking us to do something completely out of sync with, with the word and the will of God. God is at work today through his church. Listen, as you and I, the followers of Christ, as we pray and believe God and claim his word, God will work through our prayers. God has done something. God is currently doing something. He is working today. And I'll tell you honestly what I believe God, two important things I believe God is doing in your life, in my life, and in the world today. I believe God is working today to bring about a spirit and a heart of repentance. The Bible says that we need a change of heart. 
that we need a change of lifestyle as a result of that change of perspective. I believe that one of the things God is doing in this day and hour is to remind us just how helpless, just how vulnerable, just how out of control we really are. Can any one of us really control what will happen to the economy? Will electing a different president do it? Will, will changing a government? Will uh, somehow pulling all of our money out of the stock market ensure our safety? No, absolutely. You and I cannot control all things. And I believe that the Lord is trying to bring us to a place of turning away from the worship of created things rather than the Creator. I believe he's wanting to move us to stop worshiping other people, worshiping our pleasure and our comfort, education and technology and money and sports rather than God himself. God is drawing us. He's saying to us, listen, come to me and find rest. Come to me and find the hope that you're truly looking for. You know, it's an interesting thing. I was watching the news the other night and there was a, a comment about the fact that the sports world sort of shut down the other day and they showed this huge uh, newspaper article, huge type. It said this, the day the sports world stopped. And the commentator's comment was this, isn't that, isn't that something? He said, uh, what do we do when all these crises? Uh, don't we, we turn to sports. Sports is our escape. And my thought was, yeah, you know, our heavenly father's at work and maybe he's trying to remove all of the escapes that we would typically turn to. Why? So that we'll turn to him so that he can give us the ultimate hope, the ultimate peace and the ultimate gift that we need, the gift of right relationship with him. I believe he's working to bring repentance and secondly, to prepare us for the second return of Jesus Christ. And that brings me to my last point this morning. We have hope this morning, first of all, because of who God in is, his nature and his character, he does not change. We have hope because of what he has done through Christ. We have hope because of what he is currently doing in the world today. And you and I have hope because of what he's getting ready to do, praise God. As followers of Christ, when we go to the word, we know exactly where this thing is going. For those of us who know the Lord, he's revealed it to us. In Ephesians chapter 1, it tells us that God has made known to us the mystery of his will. What, every people, what other people in the world may not know, it's a mystery to them. It's not a mystery to us. God has told us in the word of God, in the Bible. And God is at work to do what? To put into effect... When times will have reached their fulfillment, God has a timetable. God's got a time schedule. I don't know what it is. There's no one who does. But God is working according to his time schedule. And there's a time when times will have reached their fulfillment. And then what will happen? The Bible says he will bring all things together in heaven and earth under the leadership of Christ. Because Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth again. The Bible was filled with promises about his first coming. But what many people do not know, there are more promises, more predictions about the second return of Jesus to this earth than there were the first. Jesus fulfilled every single promise the first time around. And I guarantee you on the word of God that he will fulfill every single prophecy and fulfillment. Jesus said in Revelation, look, behold, pay attention. I am coming soon. I am bringing my reward with me. All people I will reward according to their deeds. I am the alpha, the first letter, the omega, the last. I'm the first and last. I'm the beginning and the end. I started this whole thing and bless the Lord. I'm going to wrap it up, Jesus says. And when he comes, listen to this great, beautiful passage of scripture as I close this morning. In Revelation 22, John sees a vision of a new heaven and of a new earth as it comes down. And he says this, I heard a loud shout from the throne, verse 3 of chapter 22. And that shout said, look, God's home is now among his people. That's always been God's heart to be close to us. He will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no abuse anymore. There'll be no more murder. There'll be no more cancer. All of these evils, all of these things that we suffer, all of them done forever, all gone because Jesus will sit on the throne here says and the one who sits on the throne says, I'm making everything 
being new. And he said to me, write this down, for this is trustworthy and true. Listen, we've got hope this morning. We've got hope. God in his loving character has not changed. He longs to be close to you today. If you're a follower of Christ, you have hope. You've got the promises of God. You're a child of God. We can dwell in his safety and believe his promises. So the simple fact is no matter how bad it looks or feels or how bad it actually gets, you and I can have hope. So what should I do, Pastor? What, what should I do today? Here it is. You ready? Here's what you need to do. Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn your heart toward him. Choose to put your trust in Jesus and prioritize your relationship with him. Prioritize the spiritual things of God. Begin to look to him first. Build your life on the only sure foundation. Listen to it one more time. Happy are those whose hope is in the Lord. And our hope as followers of Christ is in him. Listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus today, if you've not yet trusted Christ, you can do that right this minute. That fear that is down deep in your soul that you don't even want to acknowledge or admit that is there. That sense of unrest, that sense of emptiness, that sense of, you know, as good as it is, it just seems like something's missing. That something is the Lord Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And if you write this minute, the Bible says that if right this minute, you would open your heart, you begin to acknowledge before the Lord that you need him, that you know you've broken his law and broken his heart. You've ignored him. But if you turn to place your faith in Jesus, the Bible says this in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For God loved the world so much, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's our hope. That's our faith. And that's what God is doing today. You know, as I was praying earlier, it occurred to me that Jesus told us in the Gospels that he would not return again until this good news about what he had done was preached in the entire earth. Now just think about that for one minute with me. Think about how many churches around the world are now broadcasting over the internet that touches the entire world. One of our missionaries recently told us that there are uh, people in third world countries with, with cell phones. They don't have anything else, but they've got a cell phone. And they're downloading and they're watching. Think about this. The gospel of Jesus is being preached around the world this morning throughout these next few days. The return of Christ is coming. God is at work. And I ask you this morning, why don't you put your hope in Christ and you can be saved and have hope and know it for sure. Would you pray with me? You could pray something like this this morning. From your heart, in your own words, dear God, I know I haven't lived for you. Forgive me for ignoring you. Forgive me for trying to be my own God and go my own way. I ask you, Lord, today, would you forgive me because of what Jesus has done for me? I want to accept Christ. I want to accept him as the leader of my life. I want to give my life to him and accept the gift of eternal life. Forgive me. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for working in me today. I praise you for this wonderful gift, and I'll live for you. A friend today, if you prayed that in your heart and you meant it, the Bible tells us that you're a new creation in Christ. God is working now in your heart and the Spirit of God is going to change you from the inside out. Make sure you get into a good church or fellowship with those who you're with today. Make sure that you tell them that you've decided to follow Christ and ask them for their help. Or you can text the word follower to 97000. Text the word follower to 97000. And it will put you in touch with some great videos to help you in this new journey that you're beginning as a follower of Christ. Now, as we close this morning, would you with me just pray again? And can we pray and believe the word of God? 
As I close this morning, let me just read a few verses from Psalm 91. Listen to what it says. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High, they will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge. He is my place of safety. He is my God. I will trust him for he will rescue me from every trap and protect from the deadly disease. He will cover us. He will shelter us. He is faithful. His promises are our armor and our protection. Do not be afraid. Do not dread the disease. Just open your eyes. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make God your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. He'll command his angels to protect you wherever you go. And then it closes with God speaking. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. And when they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Praise God. Praise God for his grace. So, Father, we ask you again today, Lord, may your merciful grace be upon us, O oh God. Lord, as we take shelter in you, as we look to put our hope in you today, Father, we pray that you would quicken again the researchers. May the anointing of your spirit fall upon them. We rebuke this virus in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask you, Father, for supernatural interventions. I pray that you would flow gifts of healings through your church, through followers of Christ around the world as we pray and believe. I pray protection over our families. I pray protection over this church. I pray protection over your people. Oh, God, Lord, that you would intervene and show yourself strong. We believe you today. Thank you that you've promised to be with us and to carry us through until Jesus comes. We praise you for our hope today in Jesus' name. And now, may God, the God of hope, may he fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. God bless you. We love you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. We hope that you enjoyed today's service. Let's take a moment to talk about your next steps. If you made the decision to follow Jesus today, hey, we'd love to celebrate with you and help you on your journey. Simply text the word follower to 97000. You'll receive helpful resources on following Jesus. If you're looking to get better connected at our church, then your next step is to sign up for LifeTrack. LifeTrack helps you discover your purpose and learn more about our church. You can do this through our website or app. Once again, thank you for watching, but we love to see you in person next week.